he asked me, have you, when you spent all that time in Traverse, did you check out High Point this summer? And I said, you know, I'd heard guys, I'd heard guys talk about it, but I never played it. And he said, no, 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 you can't play it. It was Tom Doak's first golf course. It went down more than a decade ago, but I heard that he was on some podcast talking about bringing it back. We had our first conversation. I remember saying to Tom, you know, do you really, are you really interested in bringing High Point back? Was that podcast on target? And, you know, Tom is, Tom's, brutally honest and Tom said to me well you know it's been a year to year and a half since that podcast aired you're the third or fourth person that's that's called me since I don't want to get my hopes up and um, I wound up just saying to him I'll, I'm gonna I'll take a swing at the land we'll try to figure out you know if, if this is even possible and um, if, we, if I make some progress on the land, then, you know, let's talk again. And that's just how it all started. Golf Club, Tom Doak's first ever solo design, and we're excited to bring it back to life. When I embarked on the journey, it was about having a love of the game and wanting to have a great course in this area that I'd quickly fallen in love with. And I think it's evolved into something much more than that. It's evolved into a labor of love of the greatest game, but doing something special with the game's greatest living architect in the town he calls home, and then bringing something that is gonna be this tremendous to Northern Michigan. Golf drives everything at High Point. So I wanted to make sure that we weren't compromising the routing and all by picking the spot. So we're standing here having that conversation. We wanted to do something from a new, from a logo perspective. So we inherited the name and then the idea of, we tried to come up with all these different ideas that we could build a concept around. But you know, when Tom talks about um, designing a golf course, he doesn't talk about creating holes. He talks about finding them. And when we look back at this iconic photo that was snapped, I feel like we've found our logo and we've found, you know, a story that we can tell that has significance. And then we added the start to it um, because at High Point, we just have a simple objective. We want High Point to be the high point of golf. You can just imagine after a round of golf, sitting up here on a patio, enjoying your favorite beverage, looking out over the valley of golf, taking in one of those magnificent Michigan sunsets. Really, when I thought about you know, the type of person I wanted to, to, to take care of this masterpiece and, and to be able to deliver the conditions that we're looking for at High Point. Um, you know, my time playing in the member guest at Kingsley Club and, and just being there as a, as a guest from time to time, the conditions are always fantastic. And I knew that Dan was involved in building it and I knew that he had, he had been there since inception. And that's really what I was looking for. I was looking for somebody that could build it with me and somebody that could give me 20 years or so and deliver firm and fast superlative playing conditions. So I said, you know, I'm really kind of looking for the next Dan Lucas. Maybe I should ask Dan Lucas who I should uh, pursue. I said, hey, I got an interesting development today. I think I might have our superintendent. He said, oh yeah, who's that? I said, I think I can get Dan Lucas. He said, whoa. He said, well, if you can get him, we got to get him. And I knew he was the right guy. I was excited to get him. Nobody does firm and fast like Dan. And not only was he really good at his job, but he's a hell of a human being. Just a wonder, wonderful gentleman and a great leader. And I just, just blessed to have you know, him on this team. We haven't even been together that much. <laughs> I've been out front just racing as fast as I could to get 18 greens built so he could get them all seated. I haven't, I feel, it's like I've barely seen him since June. <laughs> yeah, it really has been. I mean, for me, in the middle of these two guys, it's like an all-star team, right? I mean, we got the game's greatest living architect and, 
and this guy, I call him the commander. <laughs> you know, I was thinking when we did this the first time, Tom Ede was the superintendent who helped me. And, you know, I, Tom had been in Crystal Downs for a while and he was ready to do something different. And this just came along at the perfect time for him. But, and it was Tom's idea to put fescue out here. I mean, he started, he and I started talking about it. And I'd, I'd spent a bunch of time in the UK and thought, why didn't anybody do that up here? And, and Tom said, you know, back then Crystal Downs had like one row of irrigation down the middle and the edges of the fairways where it didn't get much water was fescue. You know, he wasn't trying to grow it. It just, that's what, that's what survived that. So I started talking to people around here about, yeah, we're gonna do fescue fairways and everybody in the turf business is like, no, that's crazy. You're, you're out of your minds, what are you doing? And the only guy who would talk to us was a young superintendent at Kalkaska and that was Dan. So I met Dan in 1987 because he's the only one who, who besides us, who thought that, that fescue had any future up here at all. Dan came in behind us a few years later at Kingsley and showed what it could be like if it was really good. And, uh, and a lot of places have put it in since, including you know all the courses at Bandon, which I've been a part of some of them, and all the courses at Sand Valley and half the courses in the Sand Hills in Nebraska and, and a few other ones besides. So. You look at the list now and like the top 10 modern golf courses, I think there's like six of them that are fescue. Even when I was growing bent grass at a couple of the courses I was at, my philosophy was always to keep it as dry and as thatch free and as lean as possible, uh, yet still dealing with the traffic. So, I mean, that is, all of that translates perfectly to fescue. Uh, and fescue allows you to take it even further. You can't plant fescue and and experiment with it and not have a guy that knows what he's doing uh, coming in there. You have to commit to the philosophy, but the ownership also has to commit too. They have to commit to not worrying if there's brown spots out there and not having to have a perfect green sword of, of grass out there and, and jumping on the superintendent as soon as there's a, a rough spot. So the, the ownership at Kingsley was, the, was committed and everybody was 100% in and, and that's what made it work. I've always loved going through the construction process and having that kind of input into the golf course that I'm gonna be maintaining. Um, and uh, the opportunity to do that again was just too much to turn down. I've always had a lot of admiration for for superintendents that work in the private industry that are in a rotating green committee and board environment. <laughs> I've always told people that if I had one guy to make happy, I can figure out a way to do it. And I've been lucky enough to work for single owners basically my whole career. Uh, uh, I have a lot of admiration for those guys that have to deal with, with a change in leadership regularly and I've been extremely lucky with the owners that I've been involved with and the projects that I've been involved with and, and the other leadership that, that I've been able to work with to, to do them. Well, this is, this is kind of the old golf course or the parts that are left of it. This, a couple of the hole numbers, there are six holes from the original golf course that are still pretty much intact in this course. Uh, the old 10th and 11th had to be renumbered, so they're eight and nine now, we're on 9T. And then there's two new holes to the south, 10, 11, and then 12 through 15, which kind of play back and forth here. Uh, we, we managed to keep the same numbers for the holes, which is good because people, you know, people remember those holes pretty, pretty fondly from the old golf course. And if we're, we're talking about the new course and they're talking about the 14th and it's not the 14th anymore, it's confusing. Well, the first time I came out here and looked at this, I was 25 years old. And, and we got to about right here and looked over this ground and it was just, you know, it was, it was ferns and, and native grasses and little pine trees that they planted for erosion control. And I just thought, you know, the, I mean, the, the front nine was mostly a cherry farm back then, but the back nine had not ever been cultivated and it, there was still a lot of natural material back here. And it reminded me of 
things I'd seen in the UK, you know, especially around London, Heathland courses. None of this is really Heather or like the, the ground cover that grows in the UK, but the rest of it felt the same in terms of the texture of the ground and the, the kind of undulations you see on those golf courses. So these were the holes that I was always the most excited about getting to build the first time around. So that's when I started thinking, yeah, maybe this thing can come back again. And, and these six holes that were kind of the heart of the golf course in the first place were the ones that hadn't been messed up. And, and uh, you know, they were gonna be pretty easy to restore. You know, on my own, I was thinking, oh, maybe there's nine holes back there. But when Rod called me the first time, I knew that, you know, when we were building High Point the first time, the Haydens bought the land to the east where the new nine is. Uh, 160 acres going that way to the next road over. And, and they asked me to, to look at it and see if maybe if this was successful, they could build a third nine over there. And they never did anything with that. The only thing they ever did was put a driving range on it. But, um, but I still remember that routing. In fact, I still had a copy of it somewhere, amazingly. So, you know, when Rod called about it, I said, well, we could try to restore the original golf course, but, but they really tore up nine of the holes. It was hard to watch. You know, it's funny that I've, I've actually talked to a few other architects and, and a lot of times we, they've, they've had similar experiences. You know, the first client to, you know, to give you a chance to do something new, you're always grateful to them, but, but probably they don't know too much about the golf business or they would have hired somebody with more experience. <laughs> so, so it's pretty common that we watch them struggle after they get the thing done, they don't really know anything about operating a golf course. And, and I really struggled personally. I mean, I was very attached to this. I didn't just design it. I was on a bulldozer building every green here. It was really hard to let go. You know, we didn't have that great of a relationship after a while. And, it, you know, I was just kind of, I'd still come out and play golf some, but I just got to the point I couldn't say anything to them. And uh, so when it, when, it, when it finally went under, I was hoping they would find a buyer for it to preserve it and fix it up. And, you know, Mr. Hayden died just before the recession in 2008. So there were no buyers waving money around at that point and, uh, and nobody picked it up. So it closed and, um, you know, by the, that would have been a lot harder if I hadn't built some other really good golf courses by then. But as it was, it was like, well, you know, I've got some really good courses in my credit, so this is hard, but you know, when you're an architect, really the fun is in building the golf course and getting to play it when it's brand new. And after that, it's not yours anymore. And uh, it's a tough, it's a tough lesson to learn and understand, but you know, once you've gone through it a couple of times, it's like, oh yeah, I'm having fun doing what I'm doing. I hope it works out. <laughs> I came up when I was in college, I grew up on the East Coast, and I came up when I was in college to see Crystal Downs, which then wasn't very well known, and got to be pretty good friends with the pro, Fred Muller. And, uh, you know, it was Doug Grove, who was the pro at Grand Traverse Resort, who knew the Haydens, and he called Fred asking for advice on finding a younger architect to help build something here because they weren't gonna pay a big name designer. And, uh, and I'd just been back to Crystal Downs, and Fred said, yeah, I know just the guy. Um, when I was really young, but, um, you know, that was a great opportunity for me and, you know, a way to start putting my name out there a lot earlier. Cause it takes a long time. You know, most people don't know a lot about what I did before I built Pacific Dunes when I was suddenly an overnight success at the age of 40. And I've been working in the business for 20 years. That's just the way it works. Almost nothing. I mean, yeah, we we've changed we changed the bunkers a little bit on the on the old holes, but the greens are still pretty much the same greens. We had to we had to core them out and put new mix in, um, but we kept the contours mostly the same. There was one or two we softened a little bit because greens weren't running at 12 in 1987 when I built this the first time. We did some more work on the bunkers because. You know, I had worked for Pete Dye before I tried to do this on my own, and I knew I didn't want to, you know, he always built bunkers that were just flat sand in the bottom 
and a grass face. And I knew I didn't want to do that, but I didn't, I hadn't invented a style of my own yet. So I was just kind of experimenting, doing different stuff. And it was different, but the, you know, the bunkers weren't the best part of the golf course by any means. So, you know, now I've had 30 years to practice building bunkers and I've got a lot of guys who are really good at it. So I let them help build better bunkers this time around. I've been very reserved about my emotions about this this time because the first time was really hard. <laughs> and it's like, let's not be too emotional about this this time. But, you know, I think that'll change when, when I get to come back out and start playing golf again. I mean, that's, you know, that's what we all do this for. You know, for a long time here, I haven't had one of my golf courses close enough to home to just decide to go out and play in the afternoon. Yeah, this was kind of the surprise for me. I mean, when, when we built the golf course the first time, they only owned to right here behind the green. And there was just a wall of pine trees. And I, I actually thought that was state land. I didn't know what was back there or who owned it or anything, but it was all woods. I knew we had nine holes on the new ground and I knew we had six holes from the old course and maybe part of the old 18th hole, but I didn't exactly know where the other two holes were coming from. And then when I got a map of it, I'm like, Oh, you, there's more ground to the south? I didn't, when did they get that? But that let us build these new 10th and 11th holes, two pretty good par fours that slip right into the, to the old back nine. Wait, oh. so you haven't made any mistakes, right? <laughs> Not this time. <laughs> <laughs> Only last time. Yeah. yeah, that's the first lesson. Is every, you're going to screw it up. Uh, there's going to be mistakes made, and, and uh, the key is in, in recovering from those. But I learned a lot building the Kingsley Club because I had never been in the basically general contractor position before. Uh, when I met with Ed Walker and accepted the job, he said, well, you're going to take care of all of this, aren't you? And I said, well, I've never done anything like that, you know, as far as dealing with contractors and, and organizing equipment. And he said, well, neither are not, neither have I, and I'm too busy, so you're it. <laughs> so uh, I made more mistakes there. I think I learned a lot, and I think I've been much more efficient uh, building this place, but, uh, but that's all thanks to going through it at Kingsley. The biggest challenge probably was the irrigation system as a whole, but, but more focused on the pump house because our new pump skid will get delivered in November. In the middle of putting this brand new, shiny, uh, top of the line Rainbird irrigation system in, we had to hook it up to a 1985 pump house with uh, with controls and clay valves and and uh, things that had not been run to any real extent since 2008. We had to resurrect a 1985 pump station that had been uh, basically unmaintained for 15 years. It's been a huge huge part of what I do on an almost daily basis is checking in the pump house and and making sure things are running the way they're supposed to. And, and we're on a pretty good stretch right now. I don't think I've had to mess with anything in there for a week or two. So as it's run longer, it's run better. So yeah, the old three pump system with a jockey pump and two 250s, but it was unique because they had uh, two different basically watering systems. The front nine was all below the pump, pump house. So they ran a lower pressure down there. They have two outlet pipes coming out one running it was running at a lower pressure going down because everything on the front nine was downhill yeah. and everything on the back nine was uphill. So they got a 12 inch outlet pipe and a six inch outlet pipe coming out of here. And this was top of the line back in 1987, <laughs> but a uh, little bit left to be desired in today's standards. Actually, there's some deja vu here. I mean, when we, when we built the golf course the first time we Hackney Township was slow with the zoning oh, permits, so we thought we were going to build there. first thing in the spring, and we had really nice weather first thing in the spring, but we couldn't start building a golf course till Memorial Day because we didn't have a zoning permit. So we weren't going to get everything finished that year. We built most of this back nine 
the first year and we had a lot shaped on the front nine but we you know we we threw some seed out in the fall and just hope for the best and this time i was like okay we we can't do that we got to hit the ground running the first of april but again we didn't have zoning permission until christmas we didn't have dan on board until february or march so we you know once again we you know april came and we we could build but we were just starting flat-footed yeah. and you know it's hard enough to to build a new golf course in six months if you're really organized and ready to just if you've got a whole bunch of equipment lined up day one we didn't have that so so it's been a rush to get everything going and you know i'm a little more spread out than i used to be too most some of my other associates were working on other projects for me so it's basically brian slonick and me building this golf course and uh, then the other thing you know the first time i really shaped all the greens myself you know i haven't done that in 30 years because you know occasionally i'll get on the bulldozer and build a green but the, these other guys are they do that full time they're much better at it much quicker at it than me so it's it's kind of silly for me to be on the bulldozer with somebody that much better standing right there. In this case, both because we're spread thin and because everybody knew my history here, all the guys that work for me are like, oh yeah, you should you should build all the greens again yourself. You should, and I kind of wanted to, but but it was also pressure because I'm not, you know, I'm going back to something I'm not really that good at anymore and trying to get good at it again, you know. And, uh, you know, I had Brian as backup, but, you know, while he was working on these old holes and getting them cleaned up, I just started building the other greens, these two right here first. And, you know, just trying to stay in front of him. And instead, you know, I just figured instead of trying to get it down to the last inch or two, I'll just get a good rough version in and then it'll only take him a day to clean it up for me when it's time and that worked pretty well so i i actually did do the first version of all 18 greens here again which nice. surprised the hell out of me but it, it's <laughs> it's you know my wife didn't see as much of me this summer as normal because because the days i was home and not working on other projects i was here instead it's my first grow in it's my first golf course project um, you know, but when you when you have a team like this on each side of you, it certainly makes it easy. You know, I have a a background. My my businesses were startups, so I'm used to starting from scratch. I, I knew a lot more about golf when I started this project than I did about employee benefits and technology when I started that company, and that one turned out all right. Um, but to to surround yourself with you know two guys that are as good as these two are what they do and the whole team the whole team brings a tremendous amount of skill but what i think is equally important is they bring a tremendous amount of passion everybody that works on this team is really excited to be a part of this project they understand its importance and i've seen guys grind away and and work long days and work seven days a week and they, they do it smiling and they, they thank me for the opportunity to be a part of this project and I mean what's better than that I mean that's that's, that's fantastic welcome to the golf business <laughs> <laughs> Thirteen and fourteen were always the two. Well, the old tenth, which is now the eighth, is kind of a, a really long par four with an uphill second shot and kind of a, a punch bowl green that you you see the flag on it, but you can't see any of the green surface way above. You. That's not everybody's cup of tea. I think in the last thirty-five years, there's been a lot more attention to golf course architecture, and most people will recognize that as kind of a a knockoff of the old Alps hole that McDonald built a lot and that some other people have built. There's been more of that in in the intervening years than there than what you saw in 1987. In 1987, that was way out there. I mean, it was something that looked like a golf course from the 20s, but that was not the style of stuff that was being built in the 80s. Now it kind of is again. The 13th green is one of the first greens I ever built and one of the wildest and but you know everybody came to really love that and it's just a very different piece of this golf course so I was really glad we were able to preserve that you know the the worst hole on the golf course by far originally was the old 18th hole 
a par five that people hit their second shot in the lake a lot. <laughs> the lines that the DNR gave me to work around were a little more tougher than I expected. And it was too late to change my mind on the hole I was building back then. So we were just kind of stuck with it. But this time it was like, okay, that hole can't be the same. We've got to do something different with that hole. We're still using the ground, but we're, we got to use it in a different way. So now you actually, you come off the back of the 15th green and the tee is most of the way down the hill right there. But that second shot that was so hard I've got is the tee shot now. So you could you, you have more control of that and you can put people on the, the right tee where they can hit that shot and not get wet all the time. And then it turns and goes up the hill behind behind the uh, eighth tee here, which is you know much further up the hill than it used to. But so it's not an easy hole, but it's you know it's manageable. You you, you don't feel like you're gonna lose a ball and not finish the hole. Um, the the new holes on the other side, I'm curious. You know the the one that I the one that I have been the most curious about since I routed it way back when is is what's now number seven, a really short bar four, kind of like hilltop to hilltop with a big valley in between and a couple of bunkers on the approach. And it's like, you know, some people will just be trying to smash it at the green there, but if you're not, it's going to take a few plays to figure out where is the best place for me to go and get a good look at the approach shot and and have some control over it because the green is not very big and it falls off pretty hard to the left. Um, and then, I, you know, the other hole that I know people will be interested in because it's really different. When we got, you know, two of the par threes are inherited from the old golf course and they were both kind of uh, 150 to 170 yards. And then um, one of the par th one of the new par threes, the sixth hole is about 180 or 190. So, you know, when it came to the last one, number three, we didn't have a really short par three and we didn't have a really long par three. And I asked Rod which one he, which, which one would he rather I do? And he said, oh, I'd, I'd, I'd like to have a short par three that's really tough. It's hard to build a short par three that's tough because you really want to build a small green and superintendents don't want to build a small green anymore. Um, you know, they, they want to be able to move the pin around. They want to have plenty of space to move the pin around and make sure that one spot doesn't get too worn out. So. So when I ask a superintendent, you know, what's the minimum size of a green I can do? They'll say 5,000 square feet. And that's, you know, that's not a small green. That's from 130 yards, that's not frightening at all. Um, so after thinking about this third hole for a while, I thought I did it once at Pacific Dunes for different reasons, but I saw Tom Fazio do it a few times back in the day. To, to build a small green, he built a hole with two greens. And if you build a hole with two greens and you're not using this one every time, you can't afford to make that smaller. So that's what we did for number three. We built a green at 130 yards. That's about a 3,000, 3,500 square foot green with a lot of trouble around it. And it's gonna be a scary little hole. We also built a green at like 230 yards over the ridge, you know, falling away a little bit at the back. That's gonna be a hard hole just cause it's a long par three. I think if the members play twice a day or, or come up for two or three days, they'll play both of them some of the time. Exactly how we'll work it out for daily setup, I, I, I'm not sure yet. We've talked a little about it, whether we, we keep flags in both holes all the time. I think you probably will. The group can choose, now we did that one already, let's do the other one. Or no, we wanna, we're gonna set the course record so we gotta play the long one today. <laughs> <laughs> Half the people playing for the potential course record would be like, oh no, now I gotta play from here. <laughs> that long one is no bargain either. No, that's a hard <laughs> hole to the back to the back green. It's it's not a it's not a real big green either. And it's you know, it doesn't have bunk, a lot of bunkers around it, but it's just it's a long shot for that kind of hole.